right, it looks like it's 720. Hopefully this is working. Are we good to go, Alan? Yeah, you're good to go. All right, well, welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are. I wish I could be with you in person to have a little chat, but this will work. If you have any questions, please put them in the Slack and at me, and then my little phone will ding here. I'm at my house here in the United States. And I'm excited to be talking a little bit about uh, deep learning, a friendly introduction to deep learning for computer vision. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to get into the rudiments of what it's actually doing, how it works. Now, you might not understand everything, and that's okay, but hopefully you'll get the gist of what it actually is, how you should actually think about it, and how you can actually implement it in your own workflows, or at least if not do machine learning, use it. Uh, and so that's the that's the main idea. Again, if you have any questions, please ask in the, uh, I think we're in uh, room seven. Uh, so please make sure, or let me make sure, yes, conference room seven, and I'll have my uh, chat open here so I can see everything that you're telling me. Okay, so uh, here's the agenda. We're gonna talk a little bit about what makes machine learning a little bit different. We're gonna talk about data, we're talking about creating models, making better models, and then using models. And we're gonna do it all with PyTorch. I like using computer vision as the impetus because you don't have to think about a lot of other stuff that you do in machine learning, for example, feature selection and that kind of stuff, because it's pretty easy, a picture is a picture. But that's what we are going to be talking about today. And I'm going to go really fast because I'm going to try to cover a lot of stuff. Again, if there's any questions, uh, please put it in the um, right here. I'm looking at it on my phone. All right. So machine learning is a little bit different. Generally, when we talk about programming, we think of programming as a way to solve problems. Uh, for example, what we do is we have a problem. We think about it. We create a series of steps to solve that. And then once we have an input, the answers flow out. Uh, and that's what we do. What we do is we build the box or we build the algorithm. And then when those the computer puts those two things together and out comes the answers. Machine learning is a little bit different because there are a certain class of problems where it's not entirely obvious how we would write an algorithm. For example, looking at a picture and knowing that there's a horse in there. How do you write an algorithm to do that? You, you certainly could think about it. Uh, there's certainly some pictures where you could write a bunch of if statements and for loops to do this but it would be quite hard to do it in every case. And so what machine learning does is it swaps these two things. I'm gonna go, go back really fast because it's. I think it's important to, to get a sense for what the difference is. Machine learning, instead of you creating an algorithm, you give it the answers and the input and it produces an algorithm for you. Now notice it's just a, a subtle swap here. And once you think of it this way, everything starts to make a little bit more sense. And when it comes to actually what these terms are for machine learning, what we're actually doing is we're giving it data and it's producing this thing called a model. Now, to me, because I was, I was a C sharp dev for 10 years before I went to grad school and started looking at machine learning, uh, this is an important distinction. We are, we are used to looking at things uh, this way right? Uh, I'm sorry, this way, when we make a subtle swap to this, all of a sudden, you start to understand what the output of a machine learning uh, process is. These are called models, I like to think about them as a lazy way to write a function with data. And we're going to be looking at how to do that with PyTorch. Once you have this, once you've built this, notice that you have a model, which is an algorithm, you can then go into this a little bit of uh, this way of thinking, where now you have a model and you use that and new input and out comes some answers. So that's what I, I if you, whenever you hear a machine, there's a machine learning model, think of it as a function that's been serialized a different way and you have to call it in a little bit different way. And we're gonna look at exactly what that actually looks like uh, so that you can get a sense for how you can actually implement it. Again, the most important thing about it is that data is the key. And so if you do not have data that would be able to produce an algorithm, then you likely are not going to be able to use machine learning. Uh, now, we're going to do three easy examples. We're going to spend a lot of time on the first one, less time on the second, and even less on the third. I'm just going to, because in the first example, it's easy to conceptualize and visualize what's happening. 
when we get to the third one, it's not so easy, but the principles remain exactly the same. And so that's that's the key. So we're going to start with an example called this one. I call it the nine square problem. It's a really easy problem because we can visualize how these things are working. And in our heads, now I would never use machine learning for this, but in our heads, we can sort of create a mental model that then we can use to solve this problem, which is a simple digits problem. Uh, we're not gonna, I'm gonna show you how we can move from the first to the second really easily. Uh, and then the third problem is we're going to write, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you uh, how to actually detect the difference between tacos and burritos, the same principles throughout, right? And so once you have a good, strong mental model of the first one, you'll start to understand how the third one works. But again, the reality of the matter is we're just writing a function. Just think of it as this function H where we give it this value X. Well, what the heck is this value X? You might ask, well, let's start with the first problem. The first problem is literally this nine square problem. And basically what this problem is, if I may set it up, is we're trying to write an algorithm to decide whether it is darker at the top or darker at the bottom. Now, if you're wondering what the X looks like, that is what this is right here. And uh, for example, for this particular here at this top left, hand, uh, let me change this to red, top left-hand corner, notice that these here are the values for each of these squares. Now, this is a grayscale image. And I've, if for those that wanna be pedantic, I've swapped 255 usually means white, but I've made it black instead so that the numbers are higher if it's uh, darker, just because it, it makes it a little bit easier. But notice that these are the values for each of the nine squares. And what this is, is this represents the X that we're gonna pass into our new function that's gonna be automatically created for us called H. And hopefully that, that, that makes sense. So that's what the X looks like. When it comes to pictures in general, think of what we're giving the function or this model is we're basically giving it a picture. And if you think of what it actually a picture is, is it's basically a bunch of numbers. Think of a, think of a, of a picture or a height, a H height, height by width picture. It's basically a uh, three matrices or three tables of numbers, right? For each spot, each pixel, we have three, maybe four numbers, right? I'm gonna think of only three numbers because I'm gonna use RGB. But notice that basically what we're passing into these functions is just a literally a bunch of numbers. And that's what that that's what that is. Now, uh, when it comes to PyTorch, you have to use you have to put these numbers into special data structures. Now, if you're not if you're not familiar with Python, that's okay. I'm gonna approach this from a C sharp perspective and explain the Python as if I was a C-sharp person. So uh, that's the important thing. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is this notion of tensors, data sets, and data loaders. So let's go over to, um, let me make sure, hopefully you can see my screen. Let me go to tensors here. Uh, this is a Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, it's really nice and easy to use and it allows us to look at what's going on. So if I'm turning, I'm looking at the screen and hopefully you are seeing my screen, but this is where the magic actually happens. So for example, if I hit this particular thing, notice that PyTorch version that I'm using is PyTorch 1.5, which is the latest version. Looks like I'm using a GPU. Uh, I have a really fun GPU on my machine an NVIDIA uh, 2080 uh, for laptops. So if you see this, hopefully you see this area, that's my actual laptop. And notice that with, with PyTorch, you can actually create these things called tensors. And notice, remember when we talked about, uh, here, let me let me hit this. Uh, notice that I created basically a random integer three by three uh, tensor uh, that has this thing in there. And if you think about it, this is basically the nine square problem that we talked about. Remember, uh, 253 would be darker, eight would be lighter. And now as I'm, doing this, you'll notice that basically I have some tensors. Now, the cool thing about tensors is you can you can do crazy things like maybe add them. Uh, let's see if this is, works, x plus y, right? Notice that you can add them, you can, you can subtract them, 
you can do whatever you want with them, which is really nice. And the reason why we use tensors in machine learning is because it allows us to think about a huge set of numbers in an itty bitty tiny single variable, right? Because these tensors can be n dimensional, which is crazy. If you think about a picture, it's actually three dimensional. We have height, width, and channel, right? And so that's how this particular thing works. Now, the cool thing about tensors is that when you when I when I did this thing right here, uh, it actually made a new tensor. But what if you wanted, because these tensors can be quite large, what if you wanted to like change things in place? Well, in PyTorch, you have this cool thing that they have underscore methods, which basically add Y and then put it into X, which is really cool. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make our nine squares, right? So notice that we have here uh, a random integer uh, between zero and 255. We're gonna make 400 three by three nine squares. You see that? And we, can, we can make these all the time, which is really cool. Uh, the next thing I'm gonna do is you can, you can do some cool things like maybe change the way they viewed. Remember how when I had it in the actual slide, I had them all in a single line instead of in this matrix, you can you can change the way these things are viewed. So notice now I have 400 of them, but they're laid side by side. Now I can do some cool things like maybe create this W matrix and then multiply these things and then out comes some things. I can do some things like get the arg max when I multiply. So notice that there's a ton of cool operations that you can do. Uh, here, notice that I'm creating some answers here and notice that now, what I can do is I can take this X that I created up here. I can take this Y that I created. I can draw these things out, right? So in this case, notice that this particular configuration says that the center one is darker. This one says the center one is darker. See that? And so basically I'm able, and if you're wondering, well, what, how did you draw them? Well, it's, I just have some, some helpers here that draw stuff. Sorry, is this the right one? Uh, here, draw. I have some draw things that basically draw these things in Python for me. So it's, it's not, I'm not like faking this at all. These are generated uniformly at random. So these are the nine squares that we have. And notice that in PyTorch, what you've been able to do is you've been able to represent these nine square pictures in tensors. And a tensor is just a glorified list or array of arrays of numbers that have special things that you can do with them, like add them and subtract them. And, and do that other stuff. So that's the first thing. The second thing is this notion of a data set. What if you wanted to be able to enumerate these things, or you want to be able to store a bunch of them in a single data set so you could do work with them? Now, the cool thing about PyTorch, and now if you're not familiar with, um, if you're not familiar with uh, Python, that's okay. Let me go here, right click, and let me go to definition. Notice that the base class of a data set in, in PyTorch basically has this thing called get item. And in C sharp, that's an indexer, right? So for example, I want item zero of this thing. And then it has this thing called add, which lets you like basically concatenate these things together. And then there is this notion of a thing called length. And so basically when I when I create my nine square, the only thing I need to do is I need to say, give me an item, and then what's the length? Right. And so that's all that this is. And so if I go over here, notice if I define, let me make sure that I have, yep, that's uh, running. Notice that I've defined this class called data set, uh, square data set. And now when I create a new square data set, right, I'm going to say that I want 256 of them. Notice that it has here are the first, this is number 34. This is this image right here. Right. And then it's saying that the dark, the darkest part is the bottom which is pretty cool. Now, a data loader is a special is a special thing inside of PyTorch that lets you enumerate the stuff there in a really nice way. So when I create a data loader, basically what I can do is this data loader says, hey, here's all the square, this is the square data set. I want a batch size of five. And so I can enumerate through the data loader, get the X value, which remember is the actual nine square the Y value, which represents which one is darker. And then batch tells us that it's only gonna give us five at a time. So notice that it gave us five, nine squares and five of the right answers. Okay, so those are tensors, uh, data set, uh, uh, tensors, data sets, 
and data loaders, you saw that here. It's just a really nice way of being able to take a bunch of these nine squares and be able to enumerate them. Now, if you extrapolate further, you can use these classes and these objects in PyTorch to actually enumerate real, actual, bona fide pictures, which is really cool. Okay, let me go over here and look at the question, see if there's any, there isn't any yet. If there's any, if I'm not explaining things right, please let me know. I want to make sure that you get your answers. Okay, so we also talked about the data loader here, uh, which is square it allows us to take these nine squares and it allows us to, in a class, be able to, uh, print, in a principled way, be able to enumerate the examples that we have. Because remember, the important bit is for machine learning, especially, and for computer vision, but for all machine learning, is we need to feed in some data and the answers, and then it produces a model. And this is what you have here, right? We have the um, the data, which is the nine square pictures, and the answer, which says number one is the top. You're probably wondering why I'm not putting top, middle, or bottom. It turns out that for all machine learning, we need to convert everything into numbers. Otherwise, it does not work. Okay, so creating a model, uh, machine learning is a lazy way of writing a function, but with data. That was Dr. Internet. I think he's a Belgian scholar of uh, Prussian descent, if I'm going to be completely honest. I made that up. Everyone, I, I made that that uh, statement up. So if you want to quote me on it, you can. Remember, we talked about the X now, which we know it's basically just tensors. What does the H look like? Right, and this is where it's mysterious uh, for most folks that are starting with machine learning. How can the computer create a function out of whole cloth? Well, it turns out that it can't, um, right? So here is, uh, by the way, we wanna do top, we're gonna do top or bottom, right? And the example I showed you before, I did top, middle, bottom, but that's okay. In this one, the example we're gonna do is we're going to say if it's a one it's darker at the top if it's a zero it's darker at the bottom just to simplify things so it turns out my wonderful friends that you cannot the computer cannot create a function on its own out of whole cloth you have to give it a shape and so what we're going to do is we're going to invent one invent air quotes invent one so that uh the problem is easy to solve in our heads okay we're going to give the computer a framework or or, or uh, a way for it to figure out how to discern. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a little exercise. Now, if we were there in person, uh, I would have you think about this, uh, and I will anyways. But in your brain, I want you to actually think about how you would do this with the structure that I'm giving you next. Okay, I really want you to think about it and then try to come up with an answer. Usually people shout stuff out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna force us to use this kind of representation, okay? So I want you to think about it like this. Each X represents the number in the nine square, like so. What I want you to do is I want you to come up with some W's, such that for every number, in the nine square, if you multiply it by this W and add them up, it will give you the answer you want, whether it's darker at the top again, or darker at the bottom. We're building a machine learning model to figure out in this nine square problem, is it darker at the top, darker at the bottom? Now, you would never use machine learning to solve this problem. We're using it pedagogically to understand how these things work. So don't don't say that I'm that we use machine learning. So you can basically solve it using a if statement. How would you solve it if you're using a statement? Well, I would add the top three numbers, add the bottom three numbers, and I would return z one if it's the top is greater or zero, right? It's basically just a simple, like it's really easy. But how would you do it if I were forced you to use this structure? Now, I'll give you a second to think about it. Um, and if you wanna, if you're in the Slack, maybe, maybe get some answers in there uh, for us. To, what you think if you're if you're so willing how would you what w's would you pick so i said if i were to multiply the x's and the w's and then add them together it'd give you an answer now 
Some of you may have come up with some answers, but I want you to consider the following. Again, if we're going to add the top three numbers and add the bottom three numbers and compare them, if we were going to do that regular code, how would you do that here? Well, it turns out that there is a really fun way to do that. If we were to add, if we were to put three ones for the first three numbers and negative three ones for the last three numbers, notice that as we multiply the ones, basically the 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 one the numbers from the top three uh, top three pixels will flow up, the numbers from the bottom three pixels will flow up, but they'll be negative when they're added, right? So when we add when we add the first three and negative the last three, if it's more negative, right, then the answer is bottom. If it's more positive, then the answer is top. Let me give you an example. So here is uh, here is this one right here. Uh, notice that clearly it's darker at the top. As we flow these numbers through, right? We add five, one thirty-eight, and nineteen. Subtract thirty-five, one ninety-three, and one sixty-eight. The answer becomes negative two thirty-four, which means it's darker at the bottom. So basically, this W, this this array or this tensor W is the actual machine learning algorithm you're probably thinking this is stupid yeah it is it, it is and, and and one of the one of the pet peeves i have is when we anthropomorphize these things it imbues these things with undue human characteristics which simply just do not exist right uh so basically this w we're multiplying every number in the w with every number in the x we're adding them up if the answer is positive we guess top if the answer is negative we guess bottom that w is a model and that top bottom is an actual prediction yeah what if we want to do top middle bottom like we had before easy we just we just use three of them and you're probably wondering well what does that w look like well that w changes into this thing called the matrix and if I were to take, if you're looking at your screen, if I were to take that X, which is a nine square, turn it on its side and then go nom, nom, nom. The same thing we did the first time. Remember how we multiplied every number and then added them together. Now we're just going to do it nom, nom, three times and then out comes a tensor. Now the answer is basically whichever number is higher, that's the one that we guess. This also is a machine learning model except it's now the W is a matrix um, or a tensor, right? Which is pretty cool. And so now what we've done is we've basically created a structure or a framework where the computer can learn the appropriate numbers or W such that it produces an answer. So how do you do that in PyTorch? Great question. Uh, let's see, we wanna do squares here. So let's go to squares right here. Notice that I'm using uh, this thing called a linear model, right? This is a class. And if you're wondering what this linear model does, oh, and I forgot. And like, usually I ask people this question, but I, let me go all the way back. Uh, I always forget to talk about this B thing. W what is this actual B thing? Well, what if we wanted to guess bottom, even though it wasn't darker than the top, but it was within 5%. Well, what we do is we'd add a negative number and that negative number would force us to guess bottom more often. If we added a positive number, it would force us to guess top more often. It almost, this, this thing biases the answer either to the top or the bottom. And this number B in machine learning is literally called the bias. Okay. So we got to that part. Sorry about that. I forgot to add that a little bit. So let's look at this thing. You're probably wondering, well, Seth, I don't see any of what you just talked about here. Well, let's go over here to the uh, models. And if I go to this linear model, let's go to definition here. Notice that basically this is the, the W. Let me get out of there here. This is the W that we were that I was talking about. And there is the bias if it's in there. So basically, this is a glorified way of doing that W 
times the thing add them together plus the bias right except this is a little bit more complicated right because it has in features and out features and so basically it has to match it has to create this matrix w so that it matches what we want in and what we want to come out and so now basically all the system has to learn is to figure out which w's are the best for that for this particular problem so there you go so there's our square data set right so we're going to use a linear model right there is the x right we're just pulling we're just pulling the x out i'm normalizing it divide, divide, divide. print x and now what i'm doing is i'm literally just going to call the model x to see what it returned right because i told you that this is actually a function and this actually will run it right and so i call the model and notice that the answer that it returns is this and so we would have to guess bottom Right. And if I go into the model, notice that there are the parameters. Uh, this is the W and then this is the B. Right. Notice that it it's not really smart. It's not doing anything because we just created it, but it doesn't have anything in there. Right. It's basically it just invented some W's. And what we have to do is we have to get it to understand which W's are the best for this problem. Okay. So uh, we did this. I showed you the linear model, which is basically that construct. By the way, for those that are machine learning practitioners, that's basically a perceptron or uh, a linear model. That is the basic unit of almost all deep learning things, right? This multiplying, this finding a W, multiplying it by the input and then adding a bias is literally the foundation of all deep learning. Okay. Very good. So the question now we get is how do we make the model better, right? Because the one that we just made doesn't know anything. It, it doesn't know anything at all, right? And so how do we make it better? Well, the question is how do we actually get all these W's and B's? And now I'm gonna go, um, if I go too fast, please again, please use the chat. I wanna make sure that I get some feedback here of what I'm doing to make sure that you follow, because this is where people sometimes get lost. That's okay, I'll summarize. So the real answer, uh, the real thing we wanna do is we wanna minimize the amount of mistakes we make when we use our model, this linear model for the Ws and Bs. So we're gonna make a function, and this is where I sometimes lose people, but I'm not going to this time. Remember, this function measures badness. This measures how bad am I at it? And when I say it, I mean, how bad am I at predicting whether the top is darker or the bottom is darker? So this function, right, is supposed to return a one if it's dark or a z uh, darker at the top or a zero if it's darker at the bottom. This Y represents the right answer. Remember, this is, remember how we had like the input come in and we have to also give it the answer. That's part of the data. This is what the Y is. This will say if it's darker at the top or it's darker at the bottom, the truth. Now here's the cool thing, right? If we guess one and the right answer is one, or if we guess zero and the right answer is zero and we subtract them, this becomes zero. And when we square it, it becomes still zero. So notice that this measures, like if we're really good at this, this would always be zero. If we're bad at it, let's just say the answer is one, but then we get a zero is the, is the true, or we guess zero and the right answer is one, this would be non-zero and then we square it. So notice that we want this to be zero. A reminder, this is the actual function, remember? This is this W, we multiply, this is a special way of saying, uh, this is a special way of saying we're going to multiply each of the numbers and then add them together and then plus this bias minus y squared this is this is what our what is called our loss or cost function and this function measured badness and what we want to do is we want to pick parameters w and b such that we minimize this thing now how do we do that now i am going to uh motivate this by saying this function Let's just let's just ignore all this garbage in here, and let's just let's just put one value in there x, 
So now we have x squared, right? If you ever remember in uh, remember in um, in school, you learned about parabolas, right? So this is x squared. And notice that what we're going to do is we're going to try to figure out, pretend you're blind Mario, right? You're, you're, you're Mario in 2D land, right? And you can't see. And you want to go to the bottom. What do you usually do? Well, you press down. And then Mario gets on his little butt and he slides down to the bottom, right? And then and then notice that sometimes he slides and then it goes like this and then it just ends up, right? So the question is, how do we know or can we tell blind Mario where to go? Great question. Well, so if you were to close your eyes and you were blind Mario, what you would do is you would feel, you put your foot forward and you'd put your foot back and you'd measure slope, right? You'd measure your slope to see which way's down. Um, how do you measure slope? Well, that's a actually really good question. So what you do is you 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 pick a point here, you pick a point here, right? And then you 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 get like this triangle, right? Right? Where where is a little bit of y, let's just say d, a little bit of y and a little bit of x, and then you divide them d dy by by dx. And then we're going to do some fancy things where um where we're going to force these things to go we're going to force these this y and this this little slice of y is to go this this length to go to zero, right? And it turns out that this is basically calculus. I tricked you all to learn calculus here, really briefly. And if we take if we if we take this little approach, and this by the way is called a derivative. If we take the derivative of the cost function x squared. It tells us which direction we need to go in order to get to the minimum. So let's uh, let's talk about uh, this model. The model is the function h of x, right? That we're trying to discover. We know what the x is. We're trying to we've we've given h a framework w transpose x plus b so that it can. And then now we have to find the parameterization. And the loss function is a function that tells us how bad we are at it. And an optimizer, what it does is it looks at the parameters. W and B, and it looks at Y, and it optimizes it using that Mario technique, where it basically searches around for good Ws and Bs until it finds the best one. It slides down to the bottom. Okay, so the thing about PyTorch tensors is that they're actually really special. So let me go to this thing right here. So let me uh, let me do this here. Let me let me uh, restart and clear output so that we can start from the beginning. Okay, so here we have this tensor, right? Here is this H multi matrix multiplied by W plus B. This is the loss function, right? So here's the cool thing. It turns out that when you look at uh, PyTorch, and by the way, this is a function that I wrote. So this is literally drawing this function. Let me let me prove it, right? So I can, I can basically say uh, plus seven, right? And notice that now it has another, where is add plus seven, right? Or, or or minus minus b. Uh, yes, that will that will work, right? You can you see how that, like I can basically I can basically change this and it will create this this thing. And you're probably wondering like, well, why are you showing us this? Well, it turns out that when you're trying to find this function that tells us the slope at every point to know where to go. Uh, PyTorch is very special in that because it has this computational graph, right? It is able to figure out the exact slope function for any complex function. I just did x squared, but this can figure it out for anything because it has this thing called the computational graph. So one of the sly things that's interesting is that in order to figure out the derivative of a particular function, right? To actually calculate the value of the function, you have to start from the bottom up. And so you would add this constant. You're probably wondering what the constant is. X and Y are the constants. W and B are the parameters, right? Or the variables. So it should be W, uh, a w transpose X, right? Matrix will like plus B variable, right? Subtract off Y, right? Which is the constant. F squared, add, uh, oh, I think I didn't, I didn't redraw it. Oops, sorry. There you go. Uh, there you go. So then, uh, yeah, uh, W, W, uh, w transpose x 
right? There's X plus B variable, uh, subtract Y constant power mean, right? So in order to figure this out, we would go from the bottom up. In order to actually compute the derivative, it has to go from the top down. Right, because if for those of you that that know this, right, the derivative the derivative of a function of a function uh, uh, of another function x, right, happens to be the derivative of 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 f uh, f, right, times the derivative of g, right, and so it would it basically recurs back. So in PyTorch, there's this thing called back a uh, uh, thing called backward, which would actually cr automatically tell you the slopes of these functions, which is really nice. Right, which is makes PyTorch uh, really cool. Very good. So let's put it all together. So what we're going to do is we're going to let me go back here to this thing right here. We have this linear model, right? Uh, it turns out that that uh, you know x of x h of x minus y quantity squared is called mean squared error. So it's already built in, right? Notice that we have our linear model. We say this is our cost function. We use our model. And then we get the cost of the prediction minus the actual truth, and then we we draw it, right? So here we go. So you're probably wondering, well, what is this? Well, this is actually because the W transpose X plus B happens so much, so all the time, it basically, there's one function in PyTorch called add and matrix multiply. Notice that we have the variable W transpose X plus B. It's all in there. Uh, and that's, how we figured out. So I can literally say uh, loss dot backward, and it will create this thing for us, uh, which is really cool. Okay, uh, I think that is what I wanted to show you on that. Let's go to the squares here because uh, now we can get into our smart things, right? There, there is the tensor with the with the thing, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna optimize this. Right. Notice that there, there is. Uh, I'm using CUDA. There's a linear model. Uh, we're going to say it's going to be using this CUDA device. There's the loss. There's the stochastic gradient descent, which is basically that thing that I showed you. The optimizer knows about the W's and the B's. Uh, now, what we're going to do is we're going to go into this for loop with the data loader, and then it's going to be boom, 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 boom. It's going to start to optimize. It's like Mario sliding around this function space, right? Uh, in order to do this in the loop, the optimizer is cumulative, and so we zero out the things. We call the model. We call the cost function. This tells us how crappy we are at it. We call backward to create the derivative, and then the optimizer optimizes its parameters. And so we did it 16 times. And so the Ws and the Bs that it figured out are... Oh, I I reclicked this other one. I'm sorry. So now we have to wait. W's and the B's that it figured out are, by the way, this problem is going to go really fast because, um, you know, it's a really dumb problem. Uh, how many times did I tell it to do it? Epochs? I did it 20 times. Okay. So there, there's the W's and the B's. And you're probably thinking, well, well, Seth, these are not one, this is not one, 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 zero, 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 like you, you said in, in your slide, but notice that it picked numbers that would actually work. Right. These are positive numbers. These are all negative numbers. And so if the top is dark, this would amplify it and kill the rest. Now, notice that in the second one, same thing. If the middle is darker, right, you see, it, it basically picked numbers that would figure out. And here's the bias. These should all basically be the same number, right, because it does. There's no bias in this. Now, that's what we did. Now, let's let's see if we how do we use the model? Well, great question. So basically, I'm going to create a new image, right? Uh, labels, top, middle, bottom. I basically call the model, like, because it's a function. And now what I can do is I can print out the answer. The answer is middle. Now you're probably wondering, well, what, how, let's see. Let's, uh, let's change this to a three. Now it's top. Let's change this to a three. Now it's bottom. Do you see that? And so basically, we've created this thing that's really stupid that will solve all of our basic problems. Okay, so uh, we talked about using the model. I showed you this goodness here. So review, machine learning is different, data is the key, cloud for, you're probably thinking, like I literally did the dumbest thing and I told you it was machine learning and we promised some deep learning. Well, here we go, digits, right? 
notice that this is the same problem as the digits, except now our matrix is bigger and our labels are different too, right? Instead of having this stupid little matrix that we made for nine square, we're going to have this ginormous one. Right? Our W is going to be much bigger. And remember how we had top, middle, bottom? Now we're going to have this thing, which is just bigger, right? And it turns out that like for complicated things like digits, this doesn't work. So what if we start stacking these things, right? Now we have multiple W's. This gives us, this gives us two W's. What if we, we even stack them on top of each other? You're like, whoa, this, this looks, this looks crazy. Yeah, these are neural networks with one exception. You can't just add a bunch of matrices and multiply them together and find all the W's because a linear combination of a linear combination is still a linear combination. You can prove that inductively for those math wonks out there. So for everything in there, what we do is we add a function inside each layer such that when we when when we do that W transpose X plus B, a bunch of numbers come out. We put we run a function over it right that causes a non-linearity and then we pass it forward right and then we get these kinds of things that look like this and this is how you define them in pytorch yes my wonderful friends i think i have my digits here um before we get that turns out this doesn't work very well <laughs> notice that we're using a linear uh, an input linear. Notice that this is a 28 by 28 pixel image, and so we're flattening it out. Out like before, we're going to have a 512 in, another 512 to 512, 512 to 10. Notice that when we when we do forward, forward basically is, remember how we pass the thing forward and backward is the gradients, right? So the forward pass, you have to define this in uh, uh, PyTorch. This is the, so by the way, this is a module class. You create a neural network. Notice that when we call forward, we basically run the activation function on the first layer, out comes X, run the activation function on the second layer, out comes X, then we output X, and then I'm, I'm doing a softmax, which is nice. Uh, basically forces all of the answers to sum to one. But this isn't very good, right? Because it turns out that uh, if I were to flatten this out, right, we would lose relationships like this, right? Because these pixels would all be laid out. So how do I, how do I get these pixels to know about each other. Well, this is where something called filters and pulling comes in. So we can do a, a special type of, um, we can do a special type of multiplication such that we take these nine numbers, do the double, we'll pretend this is W, right? We multiply one, one times two, one times four, one times nine, zero times six, yeah. And then we put the answer in here, right? And then we can do it again, right? and then put the answer right here. And then we can do it one more time over here uh, and then put the answer over here. And then we can do it one last time, yellow uh, over here. And then we can put the answer over here, right? That's called a filter. And I'm gonna tell you something that looks completely nonsensical, but you'll see why in a second. Uh, one of the things is that this destroys images. Uh, and so if you pad with zeros, it's called padding, then you can actually get the same size of the image. So notice that here we have one, two, three, four, and then we multiply each one of these four by this thing, and then we get four numbers here. Okay, pooling is destructive. Basically, we can take these, uh, oops, uh, erase. Uh, basically, we can take these four things, shrink it down, pick the max one, this is called max pooling, max number over here, uh, max number over here, and so on and so forth. And you're probably wondering, what the heck does that even do? I'm glad you asked. Uh, here we go. I made, I made a, I made a, they're called convolutions or filters. I'm, I'm doing this. I wrote some code to do this. This is the pooling, max pooling. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to filter an image. So there's our W, right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this W, right? Which is that filter. And I'm going to use, and I'm going to, I'm going to pull an, up an important picture. That's important to me. Notice that there's there's the picture of the wedding, obviously very important. Notice what happens when I do a convolution over it. Pow! Ah! Pretty cool, right? So this W right here, one, 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 zero, 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 minus one, minus one. When I do that, that, that over the picture, it basically creates this picture. You see what it did? It found the edges, just that filter. Now when I pull it, it enhances. Yes. Let's do another picture. 
of the kids. Yeah, super important, right? Notice it found the edges and then it enhanced something, something, um, something more, more sensical. Pow, enhance, pow. Notice that this filter and this pooling created a new image for us. And so when we're looking at this new neural network, basically, if we have a convolutional layer, this will invent its own Ws such that it will produce other pictures for itself in order to decide. Bananas. Bananas, right? This is how you do this in, in uh, this is how you do this in uh, PyTorch. You basically like, there's a new CNN convolutional neural network. You basically give it convolutional layers and then finish with fully connected layers. And then the forward is there. And you're probably wondering, does this work? It actually works really well. May I show you? By the way, uh, MNIST is the digits. It's uh, basically uh, one of the data sets that are available. Uh, here are, I'm going to draw them, right? There you can see five here. Uh, CUDA, yes. Here is the convolutional neural network. Right. And basically the same steps we had before for squares, except we're using a different neural uh, convolutional neural network. This is going to take some, uh, how many, 10 epochs? Oh, geez, I should have ran this before. As it's running, what we're going to do is notice that you can evaluate this, right? You can load the test data and we, we say no grad because we don't want to do accumulations. Notice that we're basically going to predict and we're going to see if it got the right answer. Remember, the way you know what the right answer is, is this vector comes out, remember for top, middle, bottom, and if it's one in the middle, it's middle. For this, it's instead of top, middle, bottom, it's zero through nine. And so the argmax or the index of the largest uh, number in the image tells you what, what thing it is. And notice that it got 97% accuracy and it's pretty cool. Uh, well, it's gonna take some time. I should have, I did run it before, but I wanted to actually show you. So notice here that, uh, no, I'll just let that run uh, because you can actually export this. Uh, you can actually export this as a model. Uh, so uh, let me show you, it's this superfile.model. So let's reveal this in Explorer here and let's open it up. And you're probably wondering, what is it gonna do when we open this up? Well, basically remember, this is the convolutions, right? In, inside, you're, you're probably wondering, well, what's in there? Well, uh, it turns out that it's basically just the numbers I was telling you about pretty, pretty handy dandy. Uh, and you can actually use this. And so I was smart because I saved this model out and because I save this model out, I can actually load it up. Right? So there's how you save the model. And let's see, uh, I probably should have loaded the model. Oh, I did see, I was super clever. So here are the digits again for your, uh, for your, um, Oh, it's, it's going to have to wait. Dang it. It's going to have to wait till it's done. That's okay. So basically, this is how you load the model up. You basically use uh, this thing called RT inference session, which is Onyx. Onyx is like a PDF for neural networks. I'm going to load this up. Notice that for this session, there's some inputs and some outputs. Notice that for the I, what we're passing in for the run is we're basically giving it a digit. And for the digit, notice I just picked the first one, uh, which is, if I remember right, over here, zero, one, it's a zero, right? Because that's the first one. And notice that when I pull it out, sorry, I have to scroll all the way down. When I pull it out, I basically say session.run, here's the output name, and there is the prediction. Notice that the prediction is an array of size 10, and the number that's highest is the one that we guess. So we say argmax, and the model thinks it is a zero, which is right. Are you done yet? Ugh, that's the thing. That's the part of my machine learning. You just gotta wait because Mario's running up in there trying to figure out like what the best W's and B's are, but there are more W's and B's. There's a lot more parameters because there's one for convolutional, there's one for fully connected layer. And so it goes and does that. And I can promise you that it indeed does work. Again, the cool thing about it is we can just save this out, small out to this model file. Okay. All right. Uh, is this still running? How, how are we doing? 
it's just it's gonna run but that's okay all right so that's how this works for digits pretty handy dandy if i do say so myself uh we did that full run together just a little review number two machine learning is different data is the key tensor data sets data loaders we created a model right we made the model better using a loss cost optimization we used the model by saving loading we're using using onyx now it's time for the ps de resistance which is really cool uh you're probably wondering how do we do actual pictures well i'm glad you asked let's go over here to uh this we'll reveal this in explorer here here's our data uh here's our full data so here's our burritos how did that get in there uh burrito and let's go to our tacos here notice again same principles uh everything is basically the same the script's just a little bit bigger all right uh not this one i don't want this one uh so when i train the model again we're going in the epochs right we're going over using data loaders right? just like we had before we zero grad right there's a training and a, and a other phase notice we have the opt a loss out backwards step right and then we we keep it's the same basic thing you're probably like, well what does your data loader look like step great question turns out that there are these data sets called image folders inside which do all the job it's basically a cool data set for me and then the data loader i basically use the image folder and it just looks at the folder which is fantastical i have one for training and one for validation now you're probably wondering what does that mean well when we train we use data to create the function and then the validation tells us if we're good at it or not so when someone says they're getting 96 percent accuracy on a model beware it doesn't mean 96 percent accuracy over all data in the universe it means all data in their validation set or training uh or test set okay and you're probably wondering well why don't you run this for us right now i don't want to because i can't because it's a lot so I basically ran it in our cloud because it's super easy to do that, right? Um, basically, it'll create a container for me and run this in the cloud. And so there it is. Uh, there is this experiment. I did it. Uh, you can see I did it yesterday at 5.03 p.m., which is about maybe a couple, like 12 hours ago, because I wanted to make sure to have the latest. Notice that it automatically, when it ran it, you can see it, it ran it just uh like i would run it on my machine this is what it looks like on my machine when i run it by the way uh, notice that remember this we have the epochs i ran it for 25 you can see validation and accuracy the cool thing about this one is when it comes to this particular model uh the cool thing about this is let's see if i can find it uh, here is i cheated right remember how i made a model function before i basically stole one and then embedded it into my model, right? This is called transfer learning or thief thiefery. So remember how I, I did convolutional neural networks? Basically, people have built a bunch of model structures that are really good. I basically borrowed it, added an activation function, and then add a layer. Softmax basically forces these things to sum to one. Very nice, right? And so you can see I ran it. And at the end of this uh, run, by the way, I made it run for a long time, it saved the Onyx model. You're probably wondering, well, what does that Onyx model look like in this case? I'm glad you asked uh, because this Onyx model happens to be actually really quite big, right? You can see there's a, there's a, well, I don't want that one. Uh, let me, cause that one's, that one's goofy. So let's go here. I think it's there. That's a better one. Uh, here's this model. Uh, you're probably wondering, well, why, why is it so special? Well, it's cause it's just a lot longer a lot bigger. You can get them to be deeper. This isn't too deep. Uh, but notice that it has special layers that are a little bit different, right? And then at the end, you're probably wondering, well, is it the same thing you taught us? Yeah, notice that the, the weight numbers are still just in there, right? It's pretty cool. Uh, and uh, yeah, the one thing I other, the other thing I did is I registered the model. So now I have this model in here, uh, food AI, right? It, uh, this experiment ran, and if I go to the food AI model, you can see uh, here is the actual model, right? the artifacts. And then I can do a fun thing. 
like for example, deploy this model. And the way to deploy it is you can use a CLI call. I'm gonna call it food AI and we're using model version nine. This tells it how to run it. And this score file basically says, load up this model. And like we had before, we just run it. Here it is, session.run, just like we had before. This is just a little bit bigger, right? Which is super cool. And then now once I do that, notice that this actually deploys this model. And you're probably wondering where does it deploy it to? Well, there's an endpoint that it deployed it to called food AI. Let's go here and load it up. I have about five minutes. So let me let me load up some pictures of burritos, burrito uh, images. And because we are ethical here at Microsoft, I am going to only use things that I can use commercially. So there we go, control C. Uh, notice that now we have this endpoint running on AKS that will do the thing that I want. So I'll do this question mark, give it this burrito right here, image, image equals coom. And then now notice that boom, burrito 73, the weight is here. This is, these are not, these, you shouldn't, shouldn't think of these as like, it's 73% confident. No, it just means that the majority of the number was in there and it sums to one. Unfortunately, let's find some tacos here. Tacos, <laughs> images, license. How about these ones? Uh, these ones look nice. Mm, tacos. So we'll put this here. And now you can see it thinks it's tacos. Nice. Very good. Okay. So there you go. Uh, notice that uh, if you're wondering, Everything I've showed you is on GitHub. So github.com, uh, the, the complicated one is food AI. So just go to food AI, you'll be able to find all of the code that I just showed you, food AI custom model. And then the other one, the, the notebooks is deep learning with PyTorch. You will find the PowerPoint in there as well as all of the other things that you just found. So there you go, deep learning with PyTorch and food AI uh, in here for that. If you'd like to learn about Azure Machine Learning, you can basically just say Azure Machine Learning Service and don't do that one. Uh, docs, I always go to the docs. Boom, here it is uh, to learn more about that. Basically, it's a place where you can do all of this stuff together. All right, so I am about out of time. I have three minutes left for questions. Hopefully this was helpful. Um, basically what we've done, just to summarize, is we talked a little bit about what a machine learning model is. It's basically a function. Now, we looked at what the X looks like for computer vision, which is pixels and numbers. The H, which is the function that it generates or the model, it turns out that it does not invent it out of whole cloth. We need to give it a structure. We showed a simple perceptron at the beginning, which is the W, right? Plus the B, right? And then we, we expanded it out by stacking these things on top of each other and adding an activation function in the middle, right? And we showed that th those structures became even more complex with uh, convolutions or convolutional. And then I showed you how to just wholesale pull the structure from another neural network and embed it. It's called transfer learning. So these structures have embedded parameters. And what machine learning does is it optimizes these function shapes in such a way to get the best answer by minimizing the loss or the cost function with respect to the parameters. And that's what produces the answers. Now, you're probably wondering why would GPUs be so good at this? Well, it turns out it's a lot of matrix multiplication to do that. Well, that is about the end of my time. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, reach out to me on Twitter or on the Slack. I will be monitoring it for today. You are welcome to get all of the uh, information. It's all on GitHub uh, and you can totally use it yourself. If you have any other questions, make sure to reach out to me. Thank you so very much 